Lights. Camera. Action. Meth makes me a monster. I was sure I was gonna wake up and this was just a nightmare. I was alone with my demons. I didn't know how to deal with it. I wanted to stop and I tell myself I would stop using, but the monster took over. In my career, I never thought that I would be involved with substance abuse. What has kept me involved? It's their stories, it's their lives, it's their hunger to get help, but no idea where to turn to. By hearing these individual stories and getting to know them like we have got to know them, we hope that you will be inspired to be part of the solution or find the courage to get help yourself. My mother had me at 13 years old, so it was like growing up with a sister. I don't know my father, but I always looked at my mom and my grandmother as both parents. And my mother, she wasn't a drug addict. She just didn't have the best choice in men. My little brother's dad is a, a guy I thought was the devil growing up. Every bad thing I learned or every bad thing that I could possibly see as a kid, I, I seen him do. It was so bad that uh, I would rather live on the streets than be at home. When I was 12 years old, I ran away. Six months, I lived on the streets until it was enough to where I would rather be at home. I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. Unfortunately, in a, a dysfunctional family. Very poor, always moving, poor parts of town. My dad was a very hard guy. He drank a lot, he used to hit my mom. You know, every year I had to go to different schools, so I was always tested. And being in the bad neighborhoods, I had a fight, and so it was just really bad growing up. I was born in Dodgeville, and I grew up kind of all over the place. My parents were married until I was about six years old. After that, it kind of got rough. My mom has a lot of mental issues. Wasn't ever happy where we were. We were constantly moving. I attended 13 different schools, and I've moved more times than that. It was just really hard. I grew up in Cuba City, Wisconsin. It was a typical middle-class family. Only difference was my parents weren't together. I had a very stressful childhood. I always had to be the emotional support system for my family. My mother had dealt with trauma in her childhood, so she leaned on me for a lot of support, and my little brother Trevor relied on me as well. I grew up in Mineral Point, Wisconsin. I had a really good childhood, a lot of fun, loving parents, support, kind of spoiled. I had a lot of friends from almost every demographic in high school. I did really well in school, played sports all year round, football, basketball, and baseball. Born and raised in Montfort, Wisconsin. I now live in Dodgeville. I had a pretty normal childhood. Um, we had pretty much had anything we wanted, you know, like clothes, money-wise. Had a pretty good life other than both parents fighting depression. I had a twin sister, Jody, and a brother, Richard. They're both gone to drugs and alcohol. I've lost so many people I love to drugs and alcohol. My father passed away Right before I was 14, the disbelief and the, the hole that was there started like smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, and that made me feel better for a while. And it just kind of went from there. The first time I tried alcohol was about 12 years old. I smoked marijuana at 14. After I had been smoking marijuana for, consistently for about a year, and then I had eventually started selling. Harder drugs came with the friends I had made after selling marijuana. Eventually the money for hard drugs came into the scenario. And then I stopped selling marijuana, I just sold hard drugs. So that was the only thing I kept around. And then I started using hard drugs consistently about age 17. Cocaine 
Xanax, Ritalin, very many different prescription drugs. I have tried about everything in between besides crack, heroin, and meth. At eight years old, I had smoked weed. I hadn't really done nothing but smoke weed until I had ran away. And at 12 years old, I started shooting heroin. It come to a point to where I jumped on a bus and went to Massachusetts. Got up there and cleaned my life up. I did good, you know, I, I mean, I, I smoked weed, I drank, but I, I just wasn't putting needles in my arm no more. And my life was kind of starting to come, it was better than, than I had ever had it. I first started abusing alcohol and then um, combining alcohol and marijuana. It did lead to using and trying everything from cocaine, prescription pills, heroin, Adderall, and meth. My addiction began with uh, pain pills. I was 42, diagnosed with ulnar nerve damage in my left arm, and they prescribed me hydrocodone, three a day, 90 a month. I was supposed to have surgery, and I just kept making excuses in order to get them pills because it became my want over everything else. My kid's dad uh, and I broke up after being together for six years. Life was just really hard trying to figure out how I was gonna be a single mom and pay all the bills. And I started having health issues. I didn't know what was going on and I was trying everything with the doctors and nothing was working. My boyfriend at the time told me to take opiates because it would make me feel better. When I was 17, I got my wisdom teeth removed. The doctor that did the procedure put me on uh, oxycodone. I didn't really think much of it. I didn't really know what that was when I was 17. I pulled my back working on the roof and they put me on oxycontins. I never did pills, you know, it just wasn't my thing. You know, I didn't know nothing about pills and I, I took these pills like the doctor told me to take them. Honestly, from the first time I took a narcotic was when I started to get addicted. As long as I asked for the pill, the doctor gave it to me. I don't really remember much during that, but I remember saying, okay, I need to stop doing this. I informed my parole officer. He had told me to listen to my doctor. You know, I had to have just a couple pills at first, and it got just to a point where my tolerance just got so great. I just had to have more and more and more. I used prescription painkillers for about 15 years. And around year 10 is when I started not following the directions and doing more and more. I started taking the pills to school, give them to other people. I would take more than I needed to, go to practice and take them, take them after practice. Yeah, I, I knew it was a problem mentally because I knew how much I loved that feeling. It's like having the flu, you know, multiply that by 10 times at least. Profuse diarrhea, profuse vomiting, restless legs, muscle aches, severe muscle aches. You're freezing cold, but yet you're hot at the same time. So you can't get comfortable whatsoever. So you just, yeah, it's, it's rough. I couldn't deal with the up and down feeling emotionally. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. You just feel like crap. There's your body is so used to something that, you know, it's telling you that it needs more. And the only way to fix that is to get more drugs. I know what that feeling is of being sick from heroin. 
It's a doctor's heroin to me. I felt like garbage and I needed to use. That was the only solution. I did opiates for about five months and then they were just getting harder to find. The laws really started changing and people couldn't get it so easy anymore. The person I was getting the pills from, you know, they were going to the city to to get heroin. And at first, I was like, "Oh, you know, hell no, screw that. I'm I'm never. Why would I do that? I would never do heroin." Two or three days passed, and I was withdrawing severely from the opioid painkillers. I caved in and I tried some. My boyfriend at the time was freaking out because you know we couldn't find anything, and so we went to Madison and. We got heroin, and that's kind of where it all started to go down from there. I told the guy that I was working with that uh, I wasn't going to be able to make it that day and explained to him how I was feeling. He said his wife was a heroin addict and sold heroin to support her habit. So off to the races I am. One of the guys that I was getting some from goes, I have heroin. And I said, no, I've never done that. I don't want to do that. Well, then the pain started coming from not having the pills. I called him, I said, well, let me just try it. And I got some and then got some more. Next thing you know, was out of control. And I turned into a serious addict. My addiction really took off after I dropped out of school. In my last semester of college, I went through a pretty rough breakup. And that was when I first dealt with real anxiety and depression. I was on the Dean's List the semester before, and then that semester I just stopped going to class. I was up to $300 a day, like 300 milligrams of oxycodone a day, sometimes more, and I blew through $15,000 in three months. It all, it all went to drugs, all of it. At first I could um, hide it and carry on, you know, with my work and my activities and everything I had to do. I had my family, I had a full-time job, we had a house, you know, a big four-bedroom house. We were doing, we were doing well. I was really good at hiding the signs, you know, I had a good job, I had a great grade point average. I was on honor roll, I was in forensics, I had friends that lifted weights, I'd gone to the gym with them. I had a job, my kids lived with me, I had an apartment, and that quickly changed. I lost my apartment. My kids went to stay with their dad because I knew that it was much safer with him. I thought I had it handled, I was working, I was, everything was great. But then as time went, of course, I start feeling effects. I tried to hide my addiction for the longest time and I could only do so for so long. You know, I was like falling asleep in front of people and I was doing shady things, stealing from people that I love and that I care about. I stopped seeing the positivity in people. I started seeing people for, okay, what can I get from you? You know, I, I told myself for years, drugs never lied to me like, like everybody else I thought was lying to me. You know, I, I knew what was gonna happen doing drugs. It just put me in a different mindset to where I, I really didn't care what I would feel like tomorrow as long as I felt good today. I got to a point where I had to do it every night. If I had went to work, no matter where I was, you know, I would leave on break to go get some. If I didn't have any, I would have it delivered to work. After years of covering up and hiding it, I started making excuses, not making appointments, not going to work, saying I was sick a lot, neglecting my kids and not being, doing what I should have been doing with them and missing more time with them. It just started to like unravel over years. Life was chaotic. It was stressful. I had one thing on my to-do list and nothing else mattered. The fear that you have of running out it, it controls you and it's so hard to stop those thoughts and get into a different pattern once that's what you've done. I planned my day around it. 
I have to get there before I have to go to work. I have to da, 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 da. making excuses. Of course, people were starting to realize that my actions were different, my moods were different, and I was being questioned. But I just turn on the talk of saying, there's nothing wrong, I'm tired, I work a lot. I met my youngest son's mother, where I met the guy that taught me how to make meth. Now, me and her are just doing as much meth as I can make. And I'm hard to be around as it is. I don't handle things the right way, probably from all the drugs and from upbringing. And meth makes me a monster. Going to work the next day, coming in late, I always tell myself, tomorrow I'll stop, tomorrow I'll stop, I'll get some sleep tomorrow. But um, tomorrow never came. Two or three months after I started using heroin, my family started to know what was going on. I went to Florida in 2017. I jumped around to a lot of different treatment centers. They call it the South Florida Shuffle. I would jump around from one to another. In the beginning of 2018, my mom visited me and I knew my mom missed me, so I took advantage of that and manipulated that into me coming home. And we stayed in a hotel for a few days and I ended up relapsing on heroin and I left the hotel and I overdosed as I was walking on the street and spent four hours in the hospital. When I first started using, I was working at Alcorn School District at Westside Elementary. I worked there for like 20 years and I was a very popular person of the whole town of Elkhorn. I did so much for the kids. Kirby's Kids was a team name for a battle of the books. So I'd get two groups of kids, mix in trouble kids with the group so they learn how to be friends. I treated all the kids the same. They loved it. One night I went to work and the stuff that I bought was a little more potent than all the rest of the stuff and I passed out in a school on the floor at going home time for the kids. Woke up in an ambulance and I just laid my head back down because I thought I was dreaming. and was sure I was gonna wake up and this was just a nightmare, but that didn't happen. That's when I knew, uh-oh, this has got me. My quality of life was scummy. I was just a scumbag, a young punk, and like in a metaphor, I hung out in the sewers, you know, with the rats, with the scum of society. I was arrested, and then I had to sit about two months in Dubuque County Jail. I was sent to a halfway house after that. About six months into my halfway house stint, I was taking around 12 pills a day. I had overdosed a couple times. I OD'd one morning. You know, my habit is so big now, I would have never thought I would OD off of three bags of heroin when I'm usually doing 10 of them in the morning just to go to work. I know I'm going to prison. I don't care no more. I don't want to quit getting high is what it is. And I feel like no one that should have been there, they weren't there. So I'm mad at everybody and everything. I steal everything that I'm getting from gas to food to cigarettes to clothes every day. I'm pretty well at rock bottom. I end up having a high-speed chase because I'm in a stolen car. I get pulled over. I go to prison in Texas first. And to think that a person goes to prison that's extreme drug addict, you, you would think that I would clean up. But I found ways to get drugs in there. I shared needles with every guy on the yard. I was there for almost 13 years. I did a stint of nine months in jail for drug charges and drug use. I was alone with my demons. I, I didn't know how to deal with it. I thought I was going to fly apart. I just didn't know. There was no help, nobody to talk to. 
when I got out of jail, um, I felt so hopeless, just hopelessness that nobody cared, nobody was gonna change anything. And that led me to using again. I got so in the negatives and set in such a dark place. I couldn't do anything for myself. I, I had myself talked out of, I couldn't leave the house. I didn't think that I could ever be pulled out of it. I can't even count the amount of times I've tried to get clean. Upwards of 20 times. I would get out of the woods as far as the physical withdrawal and stuff, which to me is one of the hardest parts. Mentally, I still wasn't okay. So I think that's why I would relapse and I would never fully commit to changing my life or embracing recovery. It's like I was in love, so I don't want to give that, give that up. Even though the rest of my life was chaos and misery, it was the only thing that was giving me happiness. So I think that's why I didn't quit. The first time I tried quitting, I was staying in a sober living house in South Carolina and I was successful for six months. I moved back to Wisconsin so that I could be with my children. Everything was going really well. And I decided somewhere along those lines that I was okay and that I didn't need to go to meetings anymore. You know, boredom got the best of me and I relapsed. I stopped using for about a month, but I was doing heavy drinking, like a 30 pack a day, and thinking, well, I've never drank that much, so this was no problem. But I was down from like 190, 195 pounds to 150. I had no strength, and I had to do all this moving. So I decided to go buy some of the stuff again. Family had found it and called the police on me and went to jail for three, four days. After I relapsed, I ended up trying meth after I told myself I wasn't going to. And I was back in my full-blown addiction, um, worse than it ever had been. It does something to your brain that makes you think that acting insane is okay. Stealing and lying and doing whatever you can or have to, or so you think, to get your next fix. The first time I went to jail was because I got caught stealing to get money for meth. When I got out, I told my mom, I said, I'm not coming home this time. Man, it's been one bad thing after another. I just feel like I can't. I'm, I've got it already in my mind and I'm going to mess up if I go down there, Mom. I'm tired of being here. I said, it broke me this time. I said, I'm, I'm missing everything, man, because I, I choose to keep getting high. And. She said, I need you to come back down here and help me watch my brother's kids. I would do anything for her. As much as I didn't want to go back down there, I went back down there. I got out and I got high again. Right away, I'm just in a place I don't want to be. Even after the first overdose, it scared me for a while, but it wasn't enough to keep me clean. So I would I just started using again. It was just the same theme. I would get clean for a week or two go back to using, you know, lie to everyone around me. They say in recovery that you need to hit a rock bottom to, to get clean and to stay clean. But I've had a lot of rock bottoms, five overdoses. I've been to jail. I don't even know exactly how many times I've been to jail now. My rock bottom um, just so happened to be like the last time that I got arrested. The apartment got raided because they found some stuff and I was arrested and I spent five weeks in jail. Being in jail is emotional. Just the people are not friendly. I couldn't make phone calls. I had no money on my books. I felt like I was alone and I felt like there was no one supporting any decision. You know, there was a lot of people that were just waiting for this moment, uh, waiting for me to get arrested. I was revoked from my probationary period in the halfway house due to overdosing and inability to keep a job. And that was the turning point because the sentence was going to be rehab, but rehabs are very full. It was about a two month waiting period 
after a two week waiting period that I was informed of. So I had said, I'm just gonna go to prison because I need to get out of my environment. I need to get clean, get healthy. I'll go in there, lift weights, get tough. There was one day I was feeling sorry for myself and just got really drunk one night on a bottle of scotch. And my wife called an ambulance because she didn't know if I was old Ian from drugs or having a diabetic reaction. And my wife mentioned that I said something about suicide and I talked my way out of that. And then the next day I got a call from Unified Services. To me, I was like, nah, nah, but I said, sure, I'll try it. And I went, you know, not happily, because I didn't think, you know, nothing was gonna help me. So I went with the idea of not even going back. But it was interesting, I went through it. And then when I w got home, I thought, well, that wasn't bad. And when Wednesday came for the second time to go, I went again. And then I just kept going and going. After five weeks in jail, I went to residential treatment. I didn't have any other option. I, I was at my bottom. I didn't have anywhere to live. I didn't, there was no other option than to get my life together. There was a turning point while I was there because I was trying. I wasn't trying my hardest, but I was trying. And somebody said something and it just, it has always stuck with me. There are people who are dying for the seats that you are in right now. And if you're not here to take this seriously, then why are you here? And that still gives me chills every time I think about it. It made me really want to see if I could do this. And that is when I fully committed myself to rehab and to a better life. My determination went from here to here, you know, I was just like, nothing is gonna stop me. So this next time I got put in jail, I just surrendered to, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot live a life like this anymore. Something has to change. And I just, that was the point in my life where I just surrendered. I was gonna tell the truth. I was gonna do whatever I had to do. My probation officer came to see me. She said she'd be back in a couple of days and she would help me and she would try to get me into drug court. I didn't believe that she was gonna get me out even though she said so. She came back on the day she said she was gonna come back. She got me out, started me on drug court and that just was life changing to me because I felt like somebody cared enough and thought enough of me that they were going to help me and that's when I surrendered and started to change. I felt like somebody actually cared. When I got charged with uh, possession of heroin. They offered me treatment court and at first I was not going to do it because I've heard that treatment court is hard and if you don't think you can stay clean for as long as it takes to graduate then don't take it. Even my past and my track record of relapses and things like that, I wasn't, I wasn't gonna take it. But I thought about it for a little while and everyone was telling me to, to do it. So I said, all right, if I'm gonna do it, if I'm gonna sign this, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna fully commit to it and I'm gonna embrace it instead of trying to do it my way. So that's what led me to the point I'm at now. Drug court was life-changing to me. 
they have so many people and so much structure and the working on yourself and counseling and talking about things. Intensive outpatient was life-changing to me. The sharing and hearing other stories it was the first time in my life I didn't feel alone. That saved my life. You know, back at the school, I felt shame and guilt for what I did. All these kids that trusted me, I would tell them the bad things of taking drugs or getting involved in that kind of lifestyle. And not to do it, no matter how your home life is, come to me, I'll talk to you, I'll help you. And then I go and do it. You know, that's just like total disrespect. So all that was was guilt and just laying heavily on me. But meanwhile, I kept going to Unified. It took me like a year to get out from underneath the grips of depression. I start seeing a little edge of light at the end of the tunnel. Even now, I'm still involved at, at this point with Unified because it's saved my life. When you're in there with a bunch of criminals who's gonna go out and do crimes again, we talked a lot about doing crimes, a lot about how would be the best drug dealers, how would you do this, how would you do that, but, um, you know, other days, you know, you, you kind of actually think about what you're going to do. And when I got out, I got a factory job making 16 bucks an hour. Never made that much in my life before. 50 hour week, 60 hour week, because the structure helped me so much. You know, I worked pretty hard, got paid really good money. I got a good job opportunity at another cheese factory that is very awesome to me. After achieving the goals I set, originally for getting out, paying off my fines, paying off my collections. That was the turning point. My wife was the only one that answered the phone for years of me calling. She's like, uh, Sean, God, man, you look like crap again. I don't want to let her down. She's the only one that ever believed that I could be better. I had like a few people just starting to really believe like, uh, maybe this dude can do something different, man, if we just get him away, you know, get him support, encouragement. My wife was there every day. I love her to death. I would tell her, man, you could do better. I promise you could do better. Well, now she's telling me that, and you could do better. We just got to get away from here. And finally, I just said, let's go. I think we had two bags when we came up here, and I didn't want to do nothing that I had ever done before, live that way ever again. If I thought it was lame before, I'm doing it now. I got a job right away. I've had the same job. I love my job. I make backyards art pieces. I try to just do positive things, I'm trying to live a different life. I would say the hardest part of recovery is being reminded of the things that I've done the last few years, the pain that I've caused people around me and myself. That's what kept me using and relapsing for so long is because I feel like there is no way out. The damage is already done. And what's the point of getting clean? I'm reminding myself now that there's plenty of time to fix things if I give it a full, honest effort. I can't take, take things away that I've done in the past, but I can be better. I can, I can change my ways and change myself and be a better person. It takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of self-worth to, to achieve recovery, especially long-term. I know I've done a lot of bad things and I, that I'm not, I'm gonna have to live with those, but I guess now I'm trying to seek redemption in society, try to pay my dues, trying to connect with people who are good for me. And, you know, I can actually see people who are doing good things and I try to just be around those people rather than the toxic people who aren't going going anywhere. My family thought, you know, once you stop, you're sick for a couple days and then you're back to normal. That's not how it works. You're sick for quite a while. And then mainly after the physical part, your brain, that's the hardest part of all. Because I thought there was no hope. I was like, I really screwed up everything. Losing my relationship with my father hurt probably the most, and then missing out on times with my little sister, my mother, and my grandparents. Because even when I was using, I wasn't fully there. I wasn't, be, I wasn't able to feel those memories and everything. And I feel like I missed out on a lot, and that's honestly what hurts the most. 
20 plus years, I held everything in. I didn't think anybody wanted to hear my my story. Nobody wanted to hear the, the things that I was feeling and that's just kept me in the negative. My life has changed uh, immensely. A year ago, I never thought ever that my life could be what it is today. Shortly after my recovery journey, I found out that I was pregnant and being a mother motivates me because my kids need me. They need their mom, they need me to be there. And I am so grateful for my dedication and determination for my recovery. Without it, I probably wouldn't be here today. You know, I got a great job that works around my school schedule. They have a great 401k, which when I was using, I don't even know what a 401k was. Who cares about 65? I don't have to worry about that. I'll probably be dead by then. And you know, I was well on my way. The benefits of re recovery are everything that I was losing or lost when I was using. My relationship with my family, my relationship with my friends. I'm a finally able to hang on to money again. In the last few years, I've, I was not reliable at all. Very flaky and wouldn't fo follow through with things. So I'm taking more pride in being reliable. I have a lot of things now. I had two bags of clothes and now I got a five bedroom house that's mine. My wife said, Sean, look where we're at. We got what we wanted when we came up here. Every goal that we said, you know, we said we were gonna get our kids back. My son lives with me. He's lived with me over a year. He's about to graduate. <laughs> My wife's kids are here. They live with us full time. I could sit back and be like, and that's mine. I, I did that and I worked for it and you know, I, I feel good about it. Feel so much better about myself and I'm confident and I can think better. I feel better. I enjoy things again, fantasy football, outside sports, bowling, everything is better. Food tastes better. Playing cards is better. You know, it's just everything is better because I don't have that pull anymore. I just have more self-awareness, peace of mind, confidence. I was one who thought I could never be alone and I enjoy my alone time now. Just sitting on the porch, being at peace with myself. I have deeper relationships with my three sons, my mother, there's trust and there's happiness now. I have so many new friends in recovery. I have a lot of support systems now. I, you know, doing jujitsu, I've made a lot of friends there. One really helpful person for me has been my jujitsu coach. I've helped him coach classes. He allows me to do addict to athlete meetings at his place, no cost. Addict to athlete is a group based on erasing addiction and replacing it with things of greater value. I wasn't part of the group in prison, but I felt like that was my mindset in prison. Okay, I can find something else to get addicted to. Exercise, reading books. My therapist had actually recommended me going to school for substance abuse counseling because one out of every 10 substance abuse counselors is a man. A lot of the people who use substances are men. Dr. Oman sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I have gained from being in recovery a sense of purpose, a sense of living a life, a sense of helping others to not have to go through that pain anymore of addiction. I'm working with Southwest CAP, volunteering, going to the Opportunity House. It's a home for individuals that are trying to make their life better. Come out of jail or prison or our treatment center, you go there and live. I go there and try to help them along the way follow rules, of course, and let them know what I've been through and how there's a way out and how this can be positive. It's making me feel better because I could help these guys and it's good seeing them making progress and coming along. I started working for the Opportunity House, just being there for them if they want to talk, being there for them so they don't feel alone, introducing them to new recovery people, anything I can do, anything that they need, because I've been at the point where I had no ride or no friends. And I blew off family up here our first Christmas so we could go deliver food to people who just couldn't get out of their house and had no one to spend Christmas with. It felt so great to do that. 
you know, uh, if it's positive, I want to be part of that. I feel good about it. It makes me feel good. I've been such a destructive part of any community I've ever lived in. This past two years, man, felt great. I was rebuilding the community I live in now, being a, a positive part of it. You know, I, I can reach out now and I don't feel so much shame about it. I don't feel like I'm just weak because I have to reach out to somebody. You know, I have a lot more self-confidence, even just handling a situation where I use drugs. I just leave. You know, put yourself in a risky situation because you got two felonies on your record. They're not going to believe you. Good luck, man. No, I just, all right, hey, man, I'm out. I'm out. It seems like my using is long gone, but understand it's never long gone. You will be addicted for life once you go through this, as we all know as addicted people. It could still come and grab you at any time. Anytime you're frustrated about something, you have to learn to deal with that kind of thing. I've had moments like I used to do a lot in the Burger King bathroom. For a long time, I passed Burger King, boom, it was in my head. I hear music when I used to go pick up the drugs and then do some on the way back. And I hear this song and it was like jamming. This is great because of course it was great. You're getting high. And I hear them songs now and it brings me back there. So then I just change the station, listen to something else. It starts with, with self-talk. Like when I, my cravings are real bad or something happens that usually triggers me to go use, I try not to act on it right away and think about what the outcomes could be if I do that. I don't want to have idle time when I'm having a bad day because my mind gets right to the gutter. Good and bad birdies on your shoulder, man. That bad one is really loud. And I have to, I have to keep that in check. And I have to stay busy, and, but I keep myself busy with positive things. You got to find deterrence, something that will take your mind from, from it. Go to a meeting, go to Unified, get a book and read. But if you just sit there and stir with it, something bad is probably going to happen. I stopped at my parole officer's office more than once just because I was having such a hard time with, you know, reintegration to society because, hey, here, we're going to structure your day every day for you. But now, now you're free to go. Don't do drugs. Don't do crimes. Figure it out. I didn't reach out before. So reaching out and talking to peer support or counselors or any member on drug court, even recovering friends. I have friends that I talk to every night just so that we know each other's there just to check in. No, it's not easy. It's hard, but you can do it. And I've done it. You don't want to go back to that pain because that's all it is, is pain. I've had some lapses post-prison. I have smoked marijuana a couple times. The first time I smoked, I called my parole officer right away. I said, I did it, I smoked, I'm sorry. Don't, don't send me to prison, you know, I'm scared for my life, I don't wanna go back. I said, I'm, I'll, go, I'll go back to therapy, I'll, what do you need me to do? And she just told me to calm down on it, you know. You smoked weed once, you know, we don't think we're gonna send you back for that. You got a job, you're doing good. I'm purely terrified of who I will become if I use again because everything's at stake. You know, I got two felonies. I'm going to be hanging out for a while next time if I do mess up. My mom died and I went down to clean out her house and to do everything. I get down there and tweakers come out of my mom's house. And as I'm cleaning my mom's house, I'm finding bags of dope everywhere. You know, I was good. Uh, it, was, it was such a stressful situation. I just got, I got so much on my plate. I don't know how to deal with it. You know, uh, my mom just died. And if I find one more bag of dope, I'm doing it. And I found it. I lost my mind for the next month.
I was had two years clean. And I did that on my own. My wife was gonna leave just because, man, I was miserable. And finally one day I just told her, I know you know. Maybe I don't want to feel like this no more. And I'm sorry. I, I really don't know how to deal with a lot of things like that. You know, real personal feelings. I don't know how people even deal with it. You know, I always I always did drugs. You know, I even called my own parole officer. I was like, I need to talk to somebody, but I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to a person that knows me. She's a lady I didn't want to let down. You know, I didn't want to let my wife down. <laughs> You know, I, I failed, but I quickly came back out of it. I learned that sometimes, man, it ain't weak to ask for help, man. You can't do it all on your own. You know, it's actually helped me more since I, I humbled myself enough to come into a person and be real about it. Look, man, I need some help, man. Are you ready to give up the pain? Because there's a lot of pain in this addiction that people don't even realize they have until they start recovery. You did that, it's an addiction. You're not a bad person. There's a way out if you want to find that way out. Looking back, if I just would have reached out, went to that counseling appointment, shared things with friends, it wouldn't have been so negative. It wouldn't have got so hopeless and alone feeling. Dealing with it alone, that just gives the negativity so much more power. If you share it, it isn't. It doesn't seem so bad. Check out an NA meeting. Now look at, listen to those stories. Ask some people who have been through it and are clean where that'll lead you, because I can tell you, you hang around the barber shop, you're gonna get your hair cut. You hang around people who are doing drugs, you're gonna do drugs. You hang around people who are successful, you're gonna be successful. Watch your environment. Love yourself enough to not put yourself in, in those types of situations. Self-love is an amazing feeling, and to not put yourself around toxic people because you know your worth, when you're in a relationship with someone who is also using, it's not even about a relationship. It, it, it's a, a relationship where the only thing that matters is getting and using. You may develop feelings for them, but it, they're not genuine. Be genuine, you need to be completely honest. That's something I was missing for the longest time. You have to listen to the people that are in recovery and that you know have had success. You need to listen to them professionals because they do know what they're talking about. You're not alone. There is hope out there. People who care. It will work if you work it. If you just take one baby step at a time, it will work. It's hard at first, but you no. Know, once you once you start doing good for yourself, people will see that. It feels it feels really good. Recovery has done so much for me and giving my life back. My life is great now and I can't believe that it could have been this great if I would have only just stopped, man, a long time ago. You can do it, you can get rid of it. I'm living proof, you know, living proof right here. Prevention takes all of us in our communities. We need to be aware and informed to help end the stigma of substance abuse.
I don't want to do drugs no more. I know that's crazy because I feel like doing them today. You know, I don't want to be this guy that's alone at nighttime in a jail cell anymore. That's where you're going to go. I got to keep fighting for myself to get my head right. And then I got to keep fighting for my kids, my, my wife. I'm going to be that man that I told them I was going to be.